breakfast puppies? This podcast contains adult language and content and is meant for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody, the Glitter Boys are in town. Every tale of every world of fiction or fantasy that we build needs the enemy. It needs a villain, and the villain has to be powerful. The villain has to be relatable, and the villain has to be deadly. In Rifts, that villain is the coalition states. We mentioned this way back in an early episode about fascist states, how they appear all throughout the Rifts fiction. The coalition is the fascist state that anyone thinks of when they think of core rifts. They are presented there in the main book. When you pick up the book and that's all you got, chances are your heroes are fighting against the coalition. Yeah, the coalition, just some brief background, uh, is xenophobic to an extreme. Well, I, I hate to use the term. I don't want to offend anyone, but they are the ultimate conservatives. They want humans on Earth and nobody else. And they want everyone in a job and not using magic to do anything. If you are a mutant designed by them, then you could be a second-class citizen. If you're a mutant for um, any other reason, you should be hunted down and strung up in the town square as an example to others. Yeah, they are pro-human, anti-everything else. So yeah. magic, bad. Psionics, bad. Mutations of human, Bad. Dimensional beings? Bad. Juicers? Bad. Crazies? Bad. They, they, they want like pure human, all skill, maybe some Borgs. And okay, we got these psychics over here, but they work for us and they're branded. But everything else is bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which also goes to show that the hypocrisy within the coalition is strong. We're talking turn of the last... I always get this feel of turn of the last century... German feel to it because I'm I'm getting this very organized licensed society because yeah psychics bad unless you work for us and you've gone through our tests and you carry your little ident chip with you then you're okay mm -hmm. it, it's that that kind of thinking the bureaucracy taken to the nth level is just it's it's everywhere now the coalition in rifts is headed by a chairman um, who is trying to make it hereditary. Emperor Prosec in the books. He yeah. was a chairman at some point in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I think they proclaimed themselves an empire. I think that was year one of, year one of PA, maybe? Or nor was mm -hmm. it year like... Okay, oh, I'm weird when it comes to the calendar. I can never remember what the exact Rift's dates history are. history is hard. Yeah. But yeah, Emperor Prosec, he was Chairman Pro. Ooh, okay. Well, <laughs> piecing this together without looking at my notes on the timeline, here's a fascinating thing. So if you look at page 229 of the Rift's Ultimate Edition, it talks about the coalition states, and it has this you know picture here showing Prosec staring down Aaron Tarn, who is staring him down right back. There's a lot of staring down going on in this picture. And it opens with a bit from Aaron Tarn's journals dating back to the year 78 PA of the post-apocalyptic calendar. And in that, she repeatedly refers to him as Chairman Prosec. Mm -hmm. However, this game takes place in the year 109 PA. At some point after she wrote that, the coalition states proclaimed itself an empire with Prosec as the emperor. It's important to note, too, that Aaron Tarn is if i understand it correctly is a survivor from the pre-rift times is that correct no she is definitely not and if she is that got retcon back in there because i know if you read the fiction that she is involved in all the way back to the to the butts edition she mm. clearly knows not as much about pre-rifts Earth. Okay. Because well, she refers I, to I'm, things like the Nemans and the the American Empire, as they called it, which if you go right. back through Rift's lore, 
is very different than she remembers it. So I think she she's from the current day now. Okay, she has associated with people, I believe, from those times. Okay, so what I think is interesting about this is we're seeing an example of basically a militarized feudalistic society with one strong person at the top. Yeah. And one, one of the things that I, I really have trouble with, with the coalition being an absolute villain is while a lot of the DBs did not ask to come here, they were sucked in through the rifts or through any number of connections through the multiverse. It's to step aside for a second out of the game. This was in fact, humanity's home that got thrashed. Mm -hmm. And you can almost, you can almost understand the paranoia and hatred of the coalition states. If you squint and look at it under a very soft light, that said, they don't have to be the villains in this piece. They are, there are uh, character classes you can play that are in the coalition. There's the, the Samus, uh, the, what is it? The operator, the dead boys and the dog boys. There are a number of coalition classes, and we opened this talking about them as the enemy. And honestly, the books, the fiction, everything portrays these guys as the baddies. They are, that would be the skulls, right? The, yeah, the skulls, <laughs> the the genocide of anything non-human, the the fact that all of their leaders have miscreant or diabolic alignments in the game, like <laughs> the things that they do to their prisoners, the things that they do in the name of, you know, human domination and purity. They're the bad guys. They are future Nazis. Yeah. For some reason, the books keep pushing these character classes as options and then they'll say oh wait well you should talk to your game master before you ask if you should play the coalition because they're they tend to be the bad guys but here they are here are the bad guys it's the riffs drow you know (laughs) it's like i'm tormented from where i came from and i want to do good and you know i get it like i've been reading some of the rifts fiction there's a trilogy of novels and the main characters of the novels are coalition soldiers and they paint a very different picture of the coalition in that fiction than they do in the rest of the rifts world books about the coalition there there is just this strange tone shift that happens sometimes quite suddenly regarding the coalition in the books it's it's hard to figure out like what what are they trying to tell us about them it's very open-ended there's a lot of discussion about this online too about people's feelings in the coalition and whether or not palladium is like overly pushing them or just sort of teasing them what do you think i think or I, i'm not privy to the discussions online what you want a baked in bad guy like you you always want that you need your Zentil keep you need your chai town you need th- these are things you need in in any world building scenario you need the mighty enemy As far as being a playable enemy, if if that's what you're asking, like, is is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I would say it's a good thing. I think that there is never a a group or organization so bad that it does not have at least a few good people in it. And their struggles to get out of it or to reform it is it's compelling storytelling. So I'm I'm all for characters coming from CS. I have considered in the past multiple times running campaigns that started off with the characters all being members of the CS military or, you know, maybe heightened elevated citizens or something that was definitely a CS adjacent or related character class. But every time I do that, the one thing I tell myself is if I'm going to do this, it very quickly needs to move to an area where they are moving away from or working against the CS. Because as a game master, as a storyteller, and as a human being, it is difficult for me to create sympathy with Nazis, which essentially is what the coalition, they function in many ways. Their imagery looks like Nazis. That's what it is, yeah. Take note, I'm sorry to interrupt, but take note, that is... Far more prevalent in the Butts edition than in the second edition. They toned down the SS jackboot all in black feel in the second edition. Which is amusing because I hate, hate 
the plastic, smooth, white and black look that mm-hmm. the coalition acquired sometime around World Book 11. I don't like it. It just looks so it it, it looks like an action figure. I loved the appearance of the dead boys because they reminded me of Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the the coalition soldiers, the dead boys, the death head soldiers, all black with skull like faces on their oh, it's uh, armor. totally Cobra, one hundred percent Cobra in many ways. So you look at that, you're like Cobra, yeah. But at the same time, again, what I was saying was, if I were to run a game like that, I would want to, I would tell myself this has to diverge because I don't want to spend too much time role playing a sympathetic overlord when I don't feel that they're sympathetic. Like, so if players came to me and they said, look, we all want to play coalition. We want to play an extended coalition military campaign. I couldn't do it because I can't role play the eradication of DBs and, you know, the, the murder of women and children of all of these non-human families that is depicted with the coalition in the fiction. Yeah, no, I get it. But I think one thing at, that's important to note is that you can't really use genocide in this because presumably all the DBs you, you could do eradication, but all these DBs came from somewhere and presumably there's more of them back there. It's, it's not a species wide kill off, not making it right, not making it ethical. But like I said, if you look at it through a large enough telescope that you've turned around backwards <laughs> by moonlight, You could almost get the point of it. And as recent politics have shown us, the reactionary, my tribe above all others, part of humans is alive and well. Uh, We like to think we've grown out of it, but we haven't. It's it's there. It sits with us. It's the caveman that chases anything away from the cave mouth. You know, earth was shattered. I I could play, I could play a sympathetic CS campaign. I, I, if I knew the rules a little better, I could probably run it. But I don't think I'd like myself afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> like being able to do it and wanting to do it, two very different things. But I think I think if you were into that kind of thing, you, yeah, you could you could absolutely do it. But I, I've also always liked the idea of change from within, right? Because the CS is very unforgiving of any kind of uh aberration or deviation or well, let's let's take it straight from Nazis, drain on the state. So in in something like that, what you would do is they would become they'd become tainted, it, uh, touched by magic uh, or uh, possessed by something, something that would render them unfit for the CS society. But they still have to work there because you know that's where their friends and family and everything are. And I imagine that when punishing, the CS would not you know not hesitate to harm friends or family in the pursuit of what it wants. So I think you could play a very sympathetic and, and very, very tough game for the, for the player characters just by having that always that, that tension of discovery always hanging above their head, that, that sort of Damocles always ready to fall at their slightest misstep. I don't, I don't think I could do it. Like you said, you would feel bad after it. That is enough for me to not do it. Like the, yeah. the having to feel bad afterward. At it's supposed to be entertainment, Dana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't want tough moral decisions in my entertainment anymore. There was a time where I might have been more open to that, and yeah. you could have convinced me, and we could have run this game, and probably had a good time. But then I think that years later, I would look back at it and think, man, what the fuck was I doing? Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> why, was, why did I think that was a good idea? <laughs> I, I kind of stumbled into the comparison to the, the drow, but I, I think that that works well. Um, that's also a, a, a xenophobic kill them all and their children kind of villain. And I think the more you look, the more worlds, the more fantasy worlds have that in it somewhere. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with playing it. I feel that the drow is, it's a very close analogy, but I think, okay, (laughs) I am playing devil's advocate to myself here, mind you, because I don't need to convince you. I'm trying to convince me. I think that as a hater of the drow, personally, 
I, I'm over them. I've been over them for 20 years. <laughs> Seriously, stop whining. <laughs> you know? uh, as a hater of the drow, I can at least look at the foundation of what they are supposed to represent, which is, yes, a villainous species, a villainous society, but I feel that the, at least the original depiction of drow society has a lot more nuance to it. Like mm-hmm. they, there's built into the fiction, into everything, a lot more versatility to infiltrate and to play different campaigns without like being gung ho, go forth and kill all the non drow. Like mm-hmm. there's so much internal politics happening there. Whereas the coalition's main defining thing is, well, protect humans, but also kill everything else. Not if it comes to us. No, we must go forth and kill it kind of thing, which is tough for me. Yeah. Especially in light of recent events. Don't don't get me twisted. I'm mm-hmm. not arguing for the, yeah. for the coalition. I'm just saying, I think you could create a compelling campaign out of it. But we should talk a little more to, uh, to our newer uh, people who are just coming into Rifts. So the coalition will turn its nose up from time to time at minor inconveniences of magic or minor infractions, such as its relationship with Northern Gun. Everyone's welcome in Northern Gun. As long as you have credits to spend, they don't, they don't care. They want to sell stuff. Now, they have a treaty with the coalition states. And on paper, they enforce that treaty. But basically what that means is if, if there's a DB in the shop and you know the coalition purchaser is coming in to get something, they will kick them out and yell at them and say, not in here, you filthy DB. And then after the coalition guys, they'll take him back in through the back door, pay him handsomely for his time. And the coalition knows this. So it's interesting. <laughs> they, they know that that's what Northern Gun does. So it's interesting to me that it's just on paper. It's just a party platform. It's not something they actually believe. You're not talking about true zealotry anymore. You're talking about... You're talking, it's, it's 1984, you're talking about the, the, the minutes of hate every morning that just kind of keeps the society together. It's, it's, it's this elaborate fiction that maybe some people at the bottom believe, but that is not embraced all the way up. Mm, it's definitely embraced at the top, 100%. Just reading the descriptions of all of the leaders as they've appeared in all of the books, there are maybe a few exceptions, but... The Pro Six, both of which, uh, you know, yeah. the Emperor and his younger brother, who is the, you know, his son, sorry, the Emperor and his yeah. son, and the son being the chief of propaganda, uh, they're the ones who are actually writing all this drivel to, to tell everybody. And then all of the cabinet, they are all like diehard haters of DBs, haters of magic. There are a few in the cabinet who do special things and get away with it. Characters like Desmond Bradford, who is the guy who runs the Lone Star facility and more or less seen as an equal power in some eyes to the emperor himself. Bradford has far fewer misgivings about magic and psionics and whatnot. And he simply is more interested in how can I use all of this to be awesome? And by awesome, I mean terribly evil. But... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What, what I think maybe I'm not explaining this right. What I'm trying to get at is that though they embrace it and say it, it's, it's a tool. I, I don't think that they actually believe it. They're just being their alignments. They're being awful and writing any tool to power they can. That is fascinating. And that is definitely something that a game master can think about as they choose yeah. to portray these characters who chances are unless you're running a very specific kind of game, most of the characters that we're talking about, the names, the powers that be, they probably will never make an appearance in your games. God, you unless, hope not. unless you're trying to say, hmm, kill Prosec at the end of it. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. 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 But that would yeah, be a fun campaign. That would be a fun campaign, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. Hmm. I see what you're saying though. And I do agree that, you can portray the coalition in a variety of ways. Like how, how, how many of the soldiers actually care about it? How many, or, well, actually I would say a large amount of them do because let's take a look at the coalition grunt OCC. The coalition grunt 
is the foundational character class of the coalition. They are young, dumb, and ugly. It's a, it's a stormtrooper. <laughs> they are stormtroopers. They are deliberately pulled from the lowest classes. They, with the promise that, oh, join us and survive a 15, 10, 15 year campaign. And maybe two of your family members can become citizens. Thumbs up. Yeah. Shiny tooth. And oftentimes that never happens because they die in service because the coalition just throws them in waves at the enemy. And it's just like to slow down the enemy while their cannons bombard yeah. them kind of yeah, stuff. They're, they're, they're bullet sponges. Stormtroopers. Yeah. So looking through the stats of them, they, they suck. Like the coalition soldiers, the, their one saving grace is that they start with coalition gear. Yeah. And coalition gear is considered high up there on the tier of power comparison in North America, at least. Yeah, agreed. Uh, it should be noted, this is all North America. The rest of the world, while they may know of the CS, has their own warlords and feudal evils. It, yeah. it, this is this is purely a, a North American problem. Yeah, they're, they're small fry in the relative scheme of things. But as Rift's core book, at least, focuses on North America, uh, unless you move beyond that or come up with your own stuff, they're probably going to feature heavily as that specter of badness somewhere in your game. But... Again, the soldiers by themselves, a coalition grunt actually kind of sucks. <laughs> like they did not get any upgrade whatsoever from the original to the ultimate. They their stats are the requirements are basically nothing. Their starting skills are almost nothing. Their ability to advance is <laughs> almost, almost nothing, nothing unless they change to a better career. They are when I've been statting them up for use as mooks disposable in my game. I've been thankful because the book really makes it easy. They are disposable. Yeah. Yeah. They're just they're, they're, they're cannon fodder. They're not particularly well educated. They're not particularly well trained. This is how to do basic service on your armor. This is how to do basic service on your weapon. This is, you know, the aims and the goals. Now go forth and die valiantly. Vagabonds in the ultimate edition are more versatile and more oh, yeah. useful and more powerful than the Coalition Grunt OCC. Anyway, that's enough about the Grunt. Oh, sorry, the tangent, the segue that I had to looking at that class, I believe I was talking about the likelihood of them not buying the lines that the government is feeding oh, right. them. Yeah, I'm hard-pressed to, to think of more than a handful of Coalition soldiers in any brigade will not the party line i'd say in public certainly yeah you're right because they're also uneducated they can't read the only exposure to knowledge that they get is the propaganda feed from the government so yeah yeah they'd have to be trying really hard to think outside the lines but you know put them in a game maybe create an opportunity for them to encounter something new that they have to reconsider start a revolution right there mm -hmm. i i find scantily clad warrior women work well for that Oh, yeah. And funny you say that is that it is a primary impetus for reconsidering what one knows about the world in a lot of the Rift's fiction as well. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's cheesy writing, but I mean, it works. Yeah. But yeah, you had also mentioned the Samus. The Samus are flying power armor. They, They're pretty cool. <laughs> they got a pair of jet engines on their back, uh, some tiny little wings and some rail guns and missiles. And they move really fast and they zip around and... They're actually pretty cool. The Glitter Boy is more iconic, but the Samus is right up there behind the Glitter Boy. Close second. Yeah, there's that uh, Desert Speeder one picture mm -hmm. in, the, in the first yeah. one where the three, the wing of three. I There's something very interesting to me about the Samus new and old style on page 234 of the Ultimate Edition. Mm -hmm. One's Predator, one's Alien. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I just... God, I hate that white and black look. I do not like the new style. <laughs> I don't like it at all. Just not a fan. I, I I don't want to insult the artist. He did a good job with what he was given, but I can't stand that look. I really like I think the black is just more intimidating. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the Samus is basically a minor upgrade from the Coalition Grunt. They don't get that much more in skills. They get uh, some ability to pilot a Samus. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a aerial it's it's a dog fighting unit basically it's uh it's it's ground support it's it's the the warthog the a10 warthog of of mm -hmm. riffs it's got a chain gun and it zips over the problem and 
blows it away from above. Yep. Where we start to actually see viable character classes for long-term play is with the military specialist and the technical officer, both in the core book. They have a much greater array of skills. That military specialist has some pretty noteworthy attribute requirements. Yeah. Uh, in a game where you're rolling 3d6 down the line, needing a 12 or higher and two and a 10 and one, you know, it's, it's going to be more rare than you think, but they get a lot of weapon proficiency skills. They get robot power armor, robot combat. Of, they can read. <laughs> these are, <laughs> these, these are the, they're not, you know, like commandos or anything, but they are definitely like field agents, recon intelligence officers. Yeah, I thought of them more as like the, I suppose the the ROTC boys that re- really wanted, like these the, the, these were the true believers in 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 my mind. But they're also the ones who, when they start to experience the world, are able to think about what they're seeing. So either that either they have already mentally explained everything and they will not ever change, but when they do, they're going to have more capability to create change because of uh, their skills and their ability to influence others, both socially and violently. (laughs) And the tech officer is the technician. They have a lot more, uh, you know, tech and electronics and uh, a skill focus of a character. Education is not a big part of the CS Mm -mm. states. They are mainly worried about feeding their people keeping them quote unquote pure, making sure that no outside or alien influences uh, seep in. And, you know, honestly, they wouldn't be the villain if they didn't try and project their power. They'd just be isolationist. But there's this take back the planet thing, take back the country thing, which really makes them into the villain of the piece. Yeah. I mean, the death's head certainly doesn't hinder that image in any way. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, then anyone who rides a motorcycle with rings is going to be a bad yeah. person. But <laughs> yeah, but 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 are you riding a motorcycle with some skull images or are you flying like a 60 foot long hovercraft with a gigantic skull in the front that just looks like a skull don't, penis? Don't forget the cannons and the spider legs, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's not just the dead boys. I mean, I I like the aesthetic, though. I do. And I think they make a very serviceable enemy, the one that you can you can feel pretty good about hating. This isn't. In fact, uh, I believe Kevin Sambita says that in his his write up of them. He gives a page and a half and says, while I have included them as player characters, they are mainly to be used as the enemies I love to hate. So, yeah, yeah, I don't think. I I think they are just there as an option because the art was so cool. So blame Kevin Long for that. Yeah, I kind of want to think that maybe somebody told Kevin, look, man, we need G.I. Joe in this. We need Cobra. So uh, we need some Cobra up in this action as a villain. And Kevin Long went nuts with it. And thus the coalition exists. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's everything of that era, too. You know, just before that, you have, you know. Uh, uh, you know, silver hawks, thundercats, <laughs> it, and it's it's all all the enemy is themed. You have Mumra, and it's it's all Egyptian, and you know, I mean, it's just that's just the way it was. Yeah, and those all got comics, and I believe the conversation was either in one of the Palladium forums, or it might have been right in our own Discord, talking about portrayal of the world of rifts and taking it all the way back to. Keeping in mind the creators of these games, what their inspirations were. Yeah. Like looking at Dungeons and Dragons, you have that crew, Gary and his folks, they got their inspirations from war games and from Conan yeah. and Lord of the Rings. Whereas we look at Palladium and we look at Kevin Sabita, and he was in the comics industry. He was superheroes and the the predator the aliens the gi joe masters of the universe stuff that was definitely very visibly 
influential to everything in Palladium from fantasy to Rift. <laughs> I, I cannot argue with that because it cannot be argued with. That's entirely <laughs> true. <laughs> so when you approach these games, especially Rifts, you have to remember this comes from a comic book background. And this is, I have to teach myself this. I have to break out of prior gaming mentalities and remind myself comic books, man, comic yeah. books. This needs to play like a comic book. And then suddenly everything makes sense and works. Just remember, this is a child of the 80s. It didn't come out in the 80s, but it was started in the 80s. And the 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 themes of of the villainy are very simple. Now, they tried to get away from that in the new one. They tried to make them smooth and sleek and, I guess, bulbous. It just ended up looking weird. I, I think they had a good thing going and they probably should have stuck with it. Yeah, I agree. I, I like the black armor. The black and white is... It's just it yeah. looks plastic is what it we should me, plastic. We should talk about some of the other stuff as well. There is books and books about just what is where, like Chai Town itself, what the organization is, what the ranks are, what life is like, what life mm -hmm. is like at different levels. How does one progress from level to level? Upwards mobility yeah. is in fact possible, not only for the person but for their family, which is probably why a lot of people keep towing the party line. Because if you have to do everything right to succeed, well, you're going to do everything right to succeed. If you want to get more information on the coalition and you know how they're structured, their military ranks, their war machine plans, the, the insides of their city and so on, there are other books out there focused more heavily on them. There's the... Uh, World Book 11, which is the Coalition War Campaign, which has a deep dive into their military structure, Yeah, their commanders, uh, new character classes, including some that we said that they don't like, like juicers. Yeah, they actually do have juicers. There's dive into Chai Town, into the structure of their alliances with other nations, their opinions on people. And that's just that one book. Yeah. Then there's the, the Tolkien war campaign to i believe is seven books about the coalition invading tolkien the first one is really all you need if you want a dive into more about the coalition but the rest of them are pretty useful too yeah there's the coalition navy source book there's another one called coalition heroes of humanity i haven't actually looked at it so i don't know anything about it the coalition is in a lot of books <laughs> oh and there are the uh the source books that dive into the chai town burbs yeah yeah and yet another game we're messing around in that and i mean it's it's hard i i really do have a, a trouble painting them as the enemy because we haven't ever as a species faced an actual apocalypse and it's hard to say what the right reaction is to that I realize that their methods are completely shitty and overborn and simple and brutal. But at the same time, we've never faced it. So I don't I don't know how a society as such as North American Seacoast Enlightened, you know, would actually fare in the face of everything going away. And uh, the part that scares me, and I think what makes the coalition such a great villain is I could absolutely see this. I could actually see that this being America's reaction. It's also worth noting that the coalition didn't start this way. They became this way through the actions of charismatic leaders and a series of unfortunate events in their later years transforming them. They started off as a bastion of knowledge. They had a university. They had access to the Great Library of Chai Town. They had mages that worked for the coalition. Actually, those mages are written up in another book called The Vanguard. They had a lot more going for them, not necessarily welcoming all the DBs all the time, like fucking Emerald City or anything, but they were certainly more open to yeah. saving the world. And then... There was a fucking grudge match that happened with their generals and the Federation of Magic and Tolkien. And they decided, well, I'm going to whip everyone to a frenzy. 
And then they started expunging people and there were these purges of leaders and, you know, kicking out all of the unwanted elements. And then suddenly we're an empire and we hate everyone and education is bad and don't read books and the library. Oh, the library burned down. Totally, totally burned down. As you know, they're just shoving it somewhere else where only the leaders can access it. Yeah. So they weathered the apocalypse and then something else happened. Yeah. There's a lot of examples like that in our history, like the, well, not our history, but, you know, like the Night of Long Knives. And you only have to look at the way Russia is being run right now to see a very close, yeah. paranoid, blame everyone but ourselves kind of. Or just look at the last four years of America, like <laughs> how yeah, things can change. It's been you know? interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I mean, that just because you can see it happening does, doesn't make it something implausible. And I, I honestly think that should an actual mutating effect and combine that with a catastrophic like physical storm where you know the, the, the seas come onto the goddamn land, <laughs> the east and the west coast gone, I, I could see it. I, I could see something like this happening. Totally. So, so yeah. So there's our bummer. There's our there's our there's our endpoint. <laughs> Here's an uplifting thing to to inspire game masters to embrace the coalition. You may be tempted to ignore them. They may seem like too obvious of an enemy. Like they're clearly painted here. They have the skulls on their heads. They're they're the baddies. And I I want to try something more subtle than that. Please, for the record, go ahead. Do whatever you want with it. But to encourage you to stick with the coalition or to at least give them a chance. The best thing that I can do as a game master is to say that there's so much information out there for them that if you need stats, they're out there. If if you don't want to spend all of that time working up new enemies, all of this is here provided for you to use. There's almost oh, yeah. nothing that you have to do to just drop them in and then mow them down with rail guns and make your heroes feel a little better because they've taken out a, a dark smudge upon North America, or yeah. at least a small dark smudge in their corner. Like Nazis are fun to kill in video game, and they're just as fun to kill in role playing games. <laughs> yeah, I, and, you, and you, you can you can do that all day and not feel bad about it. So I mean, yeah, that's all I got on them. We've, yeah. we've run pretty long, but you know, episode fifty, diving into a complicated topic. You know, and if you're if you're new here. You came in at a good time. And if you've been with us from the beginning and this is you're celebrating 50 with us, I'd just like to say thank you. I could never have expected the growth that this has given us. I could never have expected the amount of people that were still passionate about Palladium and their their urge to find others like them. Palladium is a magnificent, magnificent game with magnificent ideas and it is organized like it's still a BBS board <laughs> in, the late, in the late 80s. I love that. I, I'm really glad that a lot of you have come here and joined our Discord. And we're, we're actually talking about Palladium and, and taking it apart and putting up new ideas and making it work. And I'm just, I'm really happy for everyone who's come aboard. And uh, from the bottom of my heart, I, I thank you. Thank you for being here. I echo that sentiment. It brings such a joy to me to see people emailing me and sending me messages talking about their love of palladium people that i've never met before like i'm not tracking these people down and cornering them at a convention to talk about (laughs) palladium these are people that that now know that we're also into this and are messaging us to get in these conversations about things that we love i mean sure there's a lot of nostalgia but there's a lot of positive awesomeness there to discuss that keeps people coming back and i'm glad we can be a part of it yeah so happy 50 npc happy 50 cheers we'll see you next time (laughs) you've been listening to the glitter boys a palladium books fan podcast Glitter Boys, Rifts, The Megaverse, and all other such topics are the property of Kevin Sambita and Palladium Books. Please buy all their stuff and help keep them in print and making more games. You can order directly at palladiumbooks.com, and their entire catalog is available digitally at DriveThruRPG as well. 
Our opening music is 8-Bit Bass and Lead by Furby Guy from freesound.org. This closing music is Caravana by Philip Gross, available at freemusicarchive.org. All sound effects used are self-made or acquired via Creative Commons Zero License. If you like what you have heard, find us on Twitter and Facebook as The Glitter Boys. That's B-O-I-S. And check us out online at breakfastpuppies.com slash glitterboys. And also join us on the Breakfast Puppies Network Discord at breakfastpuppies.com slash discord. And if you want to help us out, please spread the word and help us build a community. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.